Hello, and welcome to the last part of the sequence model tutorial. So now we're going to go into deeper versions of LSTMs. And this is going to be by necessity fairly cursory because we simply only have a finite amount of time available. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at deep versions of RNNs. And before we do this in a lot of detail, let's actually look a little bit what RNNs really do. And this is a diagram that's very pretty and, you know, shamelessly copied from <clears throat> Andre Karpati's post. In any case, what you get is you can basically look at RNNs to either encode a sequence or decode a sequence or two both. So for instance, you can encode a sequence and then just from a single state. So like the initial query might be, tell me something happy. And then the language model goes and produces something happy. The equivalent would be, or the counterpart would be, if I have a sequence and I want to estimate the sentiment, I ingest the entire sequence and then I emit a token. Or I could be performing machine translation where I have many to many, and this can be both matched and non-matched. In other words, in one case, I might be reading in an entire sequence, then decide upon the appropriate state and then start emitting symbols. In the other case, I might just be matching things many to many. For instance, let's say I want to harmonize on music. Well, I probably want to match the bars such that I stay within the same rhythm. Right, so poetry gen generation, sentiment analysis, question answering, machine translation or named entity tagging, they all fall into those categories. So let's just recall how we designed our recurrent neural networks, whether they are simple RNNs or GRUs or LSTMs. And basically we have some observations that translate into a hidden state, which then gets mapped into some observation output state. And <clears throat> while the nonlinearities there are not too bad, I might want to have a more advanced hidden state. Maybe by having a mon more nonlinear mapping between the current hidden state and the next one. And so one way how to make things more nonlinear is by replacing our simple <clears throat> perceptron with multi-layer perceptron on the inside. People have tried this and <clears throat> it works somewhat, but it's not really great. It makes it harder to train and so on. So there's a much simpler way how to get there. And the simpler way is we go deeper on top of the RNNs. In other words, I have one RNN which uses the previous hidden state as an input and I keep on doing this. So in other words, I have an input, then a hidden layer for an RNN, then another hidden layer for an RNN until I get in the end some output. And in some cases, and that improves accuracy, I would actually be adding residual connections from one layer to the next. So this is exactly the same idea as in ResNet but now apply to RNNs. So this is one option and this gives me considerably more expressive powers and for using RNNs in practice, I would strongly recommend this. The other thing that we may want to do is we may want to use bi-directional RNNs. So the, here's why this matters. So let's say I have a sentence which starts with I am. And so this can be, you know, extended in many, many different ways. So for instance, I am happy, I'm hungry, I'm convinced, I'm sleeping. <clears throat> so I am can be extended in many ways. On the other hand, if I ha have I am blank, very hungry, there are only so many different ways how I could extend this curve. For instance, could be, I am not very hungry. I'm really very hungry. I'm again very hungry. Actually, I'm very hungry again is the better version of saying that in English, but you know, you can plug in various pieces in there. 
But if the next sentence goes, I could eat half a pig, well, it means this person is actually really hungry. So they probably wouldn't be saying, I'm not very hungry, I could eat half a pig, unless they're a dinosaur for whom maybe half a pig is a small snack. And since we usually don't encounter dinosaurs, well, I'm very, very hungry, or I'm really very hungry, is a much more plausible extension. Right? So in other words, very different words can be filled in depending on what the past and future context for a word is. Unfortunately, our recurrent neural networks so far only looked at the past, but in interpolations we fill in, we actually want to use the future as well. <clears throat> so let's take a quick flashback to you know, the time before deep learning, namely graphical models. So in a hidden Markov model, you also model a hidden state. So the hidden state ht is a function of ht minus one, xt minus one, and then, you know, I emit something. And so I can go and solve this model jointly by dynamic programming, where I can incorporate both past and future observations rather cleanly. So this gives me what's called a forward-backward algorithm, where I perform a forward pass and I perform a backwards pass. And then this allows me to infer much more accurately what the corresponding hidden state would be. So let's say we want to have that for our ends as well. How can we accomplish it? <clears throat> well, one way how to get there is by using bidirectional RNNs. Let's say I have an input sequence and I parse it in a forward manner, and then I run another RNN that runs in the backwards manner, and then in the end I go and generate some outputs. Now, if I wanted to use that for sequence generation, that wouldn't work too well because, well, why? Well, because basically at training time, we have, you know, the full sequence available at test time, we only have the last symbol. So we need to take a little bit more care. There are different ways on how to address this. And this is something that we're going to cover in the next chapter, namely when we talk about transformers. But for now, let's just keep in mind that if you use bidirectional RNNs, you need to take care about how to generate the next symbol in a meaningful manner. By the way, there are lots more tricks for dealing with recurrent neural networks, as said already, residual connections. There's also variational dropout for regularization. So the idea is you don't just omit, you know, some parts of your, you know, MLP for a single neuron, but you actually do that for the entire sequence. Um, the variational is kind of a red herring there. It's really dropout where you tie terms. Um, or you can, you know, use zone out to skip state updates that also makes things more resilient to essentially when you, you know, skip character, skip tokens. There is stochastic weight averaging, parameter averaging. A lot of those tricks allow you to improve the accuracy quite a bit. There's a nice paper by Mary Teodal, um that goes through this in great detail. Again, as always, all the references are in the book chapters. Um, that's a much more convenient place where to find them. In summary, what we saw is now how sequence models can be used to model, you know, text. And so we can deal with discrete and continuous tokens. We can increase capacity by stacking the models. We could also increase the dimensionality per layer. That helps a little bit, but again, deeper is better than wider. Bidirectional models are really nice for smoothing applications. Um, and then, yes, there are good tools to use RNNs to get representations, let's say of sentences for sentiment estimation and so on. Turns out transformers are better. So, to some extent, you may want to start with transformers first before 
anything else just because they have a lot of modeling advantages. Okay. To give you more pointers, uh, please check out the deep RNN and the bidirectional RNN chapters in the book. That might be useful to get you started with that.